Hi, and welcome to On the Same Page. I'm Tommy Sanders, and today on the show, the world-renowned poet C.D. Wright, who was born in Mountain Home, Arkansas, raised in Harrison, Arkansas. Through the years, she has produced 12 volumes of poetry and prose, including One Big Self, also the uh, Lost Roads Project, which is a terrific compendium of Arkansas writers and writing through the years. Her most recent work, a Rising, Falling, Hovering, and her brand new book is called One with Others. We'll talk about that today and more with C.D. Wright on On the Same Page. Thanks so much for spending some time with us today. We sure do appreciate Thank it. You. And, and congratulations on your fantastic career in, in poetry. Thank you. I know. <laughs> Who'd have thunk it? Who'd have thunk I, it? From yeah. Harrison, Ar born in Mountain Home, That's raised right. and I assume graduated high school in Harrison, Arkansas. Well, I almost graduated from high school. <laughs> oh, really? I sort of was not um, too keen on staying in high school, so I went on to... Arkansas State for my freshman year. Oh, okay. in Jonesburg. Mm -hmm. So you spent time in Jonesburg. But I well. was kind of a compulsive transfer student, actually. I went from there to Drury College and from Drury College to the University of Memphis, and then I did graduate work. Well, I went to law school even briefly wow. at the University of Arkansas, and then I went to graduate school at the University of Arkansas. A searcher, a seeker, right. <laughs> looking, looking for but the right situation. But most of my education was in Arkansas and in the public system. When in that education, or was it even during the time of your education, did you decide or have a feeling that, that, that poetry was going to be something important in your life? I don't know that I decided that it was going to be poetry, but I decided that um, I had these terrible longings to be an artist, and I had no place to put those longings. Um, but we were bookish in our house. We had a lot of books. My dad was a big reader. My brother was a reader. Uh, my mother was not so much a reader, but she liked crossword puzzles. She liked words. Um, but books were available to me. They were always available, and the library was always available. You were a reader. You were so great. I gravitated yeah. Yeah. toward that. That was something I had. I could access. And then when I was 17, I met a very remarkable woman in East Arkansas who was an autodidact, um, who made literature very vivid to me. Um, she made it seem quite authentic and very much, it was very seamless the way she talked about books, as though books, the people, the characters in those books were her familiars and language of those books was something that she could just drop into sentences while she was playing poker. This is so someone we're going to talk about when we talk the, about this, your book. So, in, in this, so that person, that was, that was another spark, I think. And then in college it became more and more apparent that the only art practice I really had a shot at was writing. How long before you realized that, that you really did have a shot at that? You had some, some facility for making poems and, and for writing. And, and when did your confidence in this process start to set in? Well, I still, I wouldn't call it a facility. <laughs> <laughs> it's still, for me, it's still like lifting a huge rock, moving it four feet. Not easy. Realizing it's in the wrong place, <laughs> moving it back. You know, it's yeah. almost like prison labor. And <laughs> Um, Sounds fun. But I, it's, um, it's, I, in even confidence, I don't, I guess I have grown some confidence in that I have come to identify with what I do. So it seems like um, a natural thing to do. We talk about confidence. I, I read somewhere in a, in a published interview that uh, as part of your education, or maybe after your education, pursuing your poetry, you moved to San Francisco and uh, worked in, in a poetry related job. Some I sort did. Of collective of there poets. aren't a lot of those right? <laughs> no, I think poetry so. la related jobs, but I I was the office manager for the poetry center at San Francisco State. And right? you, about that job, you said you came in contact with a lot of the poet scene folks there, right? And 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 you were amazed by how much confidence they had, how little they felt the need to examine or self critique their work, and and, and that that made an impression on you, didn't it? 
Well, the ports that I was meeting in San Francisco were very urban uh, riders, and um, so they were much more cultivated in the sense of urban intelligences, the clash of urban intelligences. Um, and I was really used to just reading and writing. I didn't really understand there was a discourse around it. Um, and as I was a little intimidated by that at first, but it kind of also it got my Arkansas up. Yeah. You know? <laughs> And you said you uh, said your your down home ways. You knew you had to sharpen that, that, made that, which is not the reaction that a lot of people. A lot of people want to assimilate right. when they get in a situation like that. Yes, yeah, so I was always very proud of where I was from. Um, I thought it was a very distinctive place, and I came to realize that the more I moved around the country, to cities and even out of the country, the more I thought I did come from a very distinctive place, and that I was proud of that. Um, so I carried it with me. I never felt like I had to jettison that in order to take on other kinds of things, such as the city. You know. Still happy with that decision? You, I, I mean, am. You, you think that's the right thing to do? I do, yeah. 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 It served but, you. Yeah. yeah, it has served me. And many of my books have still been centered um, in the South, especially, well, not the next to last one, but this, this one, especially this one, is at, really is set in Arkansas. Yeah. You've written, and I wish, I wish I'd written down the exact quote, that the function of poetry is to somehow find things or notions or, or, or truths within, within yourself, and, and, and poetry is a way to make that free. And I didn't quite understand that. Could you expand on that a little bit? For me? Well, poetry is, um, it's, I've always thought you had to read a lot of something in order to understand a lot of maybe a single poet even, or a lot of poetry in order to understand the language that poetry is trying to speak. Uh, what W.S. Merwin calls a vernacular that was at once common to all men. And um, so it's not that it's a special language, but it is a highly articulated and reflective language. And I, I think the further in you go, the more liberated you are by the constraints of um, the banalities of life <laughs> okay. and then the constraints of the conventions of life, um, which of course I still experience. I live in the world, but um, that interior world is quite liberating, especially if you treat it as something that's actually worthy of a lifelong inquiry. So words and images have the power to, to, to take you beyond. The banal and unlock that which is I a little more I think so, eternal, yeah. maybe or something like that. I do. Like that. I think okay. so. Yeah. I think you kind of, from what I read, take pride in being an outsider, having outsider status, and you have from from the start in your career. Well, I have, but it's hard to claim it much anymore. You know, everyone that wants to be <laughs> an outsider. Right. It's yeah. There's a there is a kind of a badge of pride in being a, an outlier, but. Um, but it's hard to teach at a research university for 20-something years and publish a dozen books and blah, 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 and, and still, still call. call yourself a <laughs> renegade. Yeah. So well, I mean, all you have to do is <laughs> read, read the work, and, and th that's the way you decide, right? <laughs> so that's sort of a North Arkansas thing, though, you, you, you've, you've said before. I mean, Harrison people weren't, weren't joiners in most cases. They, Ozark. they like they like Ozark, Ozark people, people. Is that what you said? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mountain people. What else about mountain people sticks with you and sort sort of informs <laughs> the things you do? I remember a description um, which I thought was by Hardy, which I found in and I've never been able to find that passage again, but I thought it was in the WPA guide to the state, which I always liked those guides and I thought Arkansas was an exceptionally good one. The, 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 the Works, Works Progress Project Administration, administration yeah, Guides yeah. to the State. And there was a description of Arkansans, uh, which was meant to be a description of yeomanry of peasant class uh, in Hardy's time, uh, that we didn't, um, didn't smile, couldn't sing, didn't like to fight, and not unless cornered, and then to the death. Wow. And I, I sort of identified with that. <laughs> that's okay. That's a, that's a, I, you know, you can see some of that, I, I guess. It's a, that's, that, that's pretty straightforward, huh? Yeah. 
It's a stubborn culture. I mean, it's it's it has been assimilated into the larger culture, of course, now. Sure. But those things you always attribute to mountain people, you know, you live in the same cove all your life, you hold grudges, yes. you know, nothing uh -huh. ever dies. If you do something wrong, no one ever forgets it. Is, is, is that, you think that's being assimilated and going away yes, as well? Yes, I do. Um, talking about the WPA and Arkansas, mm -hmm. might be a good time to bring up uh, one of your projects that I think is just terrific. It's the, uh, the Lost Roads Project, a walk-in book of Arkansas. I'm going to show it real quickly here. This is a unique project that, that you sort of spearheaded and, and did so much of the work on, mm -hmm. or, or, except for the photography, I guess most all the work on. Tell us how this came about and, and what is the relationship to the old Works Progress Administration? That was my template, was the WPA for that. Because I always thought I was born too late to work. I was born too late to work for the WPA. Of course. Yeah. So I thought I had to start my own WPA and I had a big grant from the Wallace Foundation in New York. And uh, part of that grant was a social project, and it came, you could create a budget for that project, and it would support the project as well as, as you during the time you're working on it. Um, so I enlisted a number of artists, almost all of whom were from Arkansas, except for the printer who printed the broadsides, who was a master printer at Brown. But the photographer was from Siloam Springs, Deborah Luster. Mm -hmm. I still work with her. Ed Nicholson um, engineered the sound for radio. Um, Richard Johnson uh, created a soundtrack for the in exhibition space. He's from El Dorado. Mm -hmm. uh, Ed Nicholson was from Harrison. My husband Forrest is from Virginia, but he did the videotaping of Arkansans reciting poems. Mike Luster, who is a folklorist, interviewed uh, 21 post-World War II writers. Um, and, and we should say that this is this is kind of a, a compendium, a guide uh, to to Arkansas culture and writers of note, and, right. and some of their it's featuring bits of their work through the years and biographies. Of right. And right. So it's a story of Arkansas uh -huh. through letters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was it was it really was one of my finest moments. I thought Kathy Thompson, a, vi a visual artist from Fayetteville, did banners for it. Um, Doug Stowe from Eureka Springs built a library table and it moved around the state for a couple of years uh, and various uh, places uh, had different kinds of programming to go with the uh, exhibition. And, and really wonderful. And uh, this map that we're looking at behind, the Reader's Map of Arkansas, was, was a product of that as well. That's right. right. Yeah. So that's sort of a bibliography of Arkansas writers from the DeSoto Chronicles to the mid-90s. And you've got, I mean, everybody from, you know, Sun Seals to uh, Dee Brown, Robert Palmer, Miller Williams. It, it's, it's a great yeah. diversity, a great cross-section. It's not complete, of course, and I'm sure that it was not meant to be complete. It never would have been. Right. It could yeah. not be. But uh, very interesting. Oh, it was a blast. Yeah. It really was. Dee Brown did the opening remarks for the, it opened at the old State House. What was the biggest discovery you made through all this sort of plowing through Arkansas writing or the most surprising thing? Well, anything. there was a poet in um, Horatio um, who was quite extraordinary. And um, so I kept hearing about her. And finally, I um, found a book of hers in a library in Hot Springs. And then I couldn't find a phone number for her, so I called the postmaster in Horatio, who said that Bez Miller Brigham did indeed live out in the country. She didn't have a phone, but she would send a message by her rural carrier. And uh, so then I, I went to Hor Horatio with uh, my small crew, and we interviewed uh, Bez Miller and included her in the book. And then I went back six months later with a film crew from New York, uh -huh. uh, and that was a big thing. That I mean, I was just a added on to that in part to get them to Bez Miller. Yeah. Uh, so that was like two big film trucks and rider trucks behind it and gopher cars behind that oh, sure. all coming through Horatio to film Bez Miller Brigham. Wow. Um, How did you find out about her? Where, where did you just start reading her Because story? I was moving around the state looking for uh, writers, just her name would come up here and there. Have you? Have you seen this person's work? Have you met her? And then when I read the book uh, that Random House had done, 
I just knew this was a real original. Yeah. You know. And this book still available as far as we know? Is the exhibition we... catalog and the map too, yes. I yeah, think they're still that. available. You University of Arkansas did look those. Look around, you can find it somewhere. Mm -hmm. Very good. Let's go on to your latest book, mm -hmm. which is just right now coming out as, as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, One with Others, all about East Arkansas. And this person we referred to, and I should reset things, we're talking with C.D. Wright, the mm -hmm. poet from Arkansas, from Harrison, and, and earlier in this conversation you said there was someone who had a tremendous effect on you, who was, uh, I assume, the same as the central character. Yes, this started out just to be an homage to my friend uh, from East Arkansas, who was originally from Kentucky. Um, and she eventually ended up in New York City, which was probably the first place she ever lived where she wasn't a freak. She got involved in some civil rights actions in the late 60s when the town was kind of a powder keg. Uh, and uh, she paid the price. She wasn't the only person to pay the price, but she was the only white person to pay the price, was she and her family. Um, so, um, so the more I went back to this town to s talk to people about her, the more interested I got in the things that were going on then. And I felt like um, even though I was, um, you know, a white woman from the Ozarks, that I could, I had a footnote to add to all the wonderful literature about civil rights, which has been quite thoroughly documented in many ways, but there's still many footnotes to be added. How much time did you spend that part of Arkansas for this project specifically? I don't know. I think I went to, uh, back there four times to that town. Yeah. There's a lot of detail in there, and, and, and detail was essential to the, to the storytelling and, mm -hmm. and to the, to the poetry. Even the, the birds and the, the bushes and the plants and the yards and the ditches are... Why is detail so important in poetry? What, is it, what does it do? How does it build up a poem? Well, I think the, a, any kind of writing, it's all made of the particulars, you know, those shining particulars that make something pop out at you. Um, and I've always liked the vegetation of Arkansas, and I've always <laughs> liked the birds, um, and especially the trees of my trees of Arkansas. I, I, think those are, I think those locate you, very physically locate you in something. And once you are physically located, at least, for, at least for me, once I'm very physically located, then I can go somewhere in my mind and in my imagination. It does. It works for the reader, too, because all those, those details <clears throat> really make all these horrifying <laughs> incidents seem that much more mm -hmm. vivid, that much more real. And, and, uh, you know, the, the work shows in there, it's probably was, was kind of painful to, to sit and relive a lot of these things with the people who went through it all, right? I think some people just really wouldn't um, go talk about it. Understandably. Um, and, um, but some people were really quite eager to talk, yeah. you know, because it was like someone was, I mean, like validating their experience, someone from the outside who was coming through there years later. And uh, for my friend, whenever I would talk to her about it, d um, she was always in like talking about it. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. for her, it was, a, as she said, the most alive she ever felt. Taking action in that Taking, was, was, yeah. was the big turn. Is the turning point in the book almost. Mm -hmm. It's a history. It's it's a poem, and it's 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 just all sorts of words and sentences and things that seem just like cut lines for photographs and news stories and things like that. It's not Wh it's not strictly it and it's very careful verse mixed in there as well. I mean, it's 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 kind of out there. Yeah, there are yeah. a lot of different ways to go about writing, and poetry is not necessarily what poetry was. <laughs> you know, I mean, if the only reason poetry has survived is because it's so mutable changing and so mm -hmm. forth like that. Do you think you've, I mean this, to me it's, it's, it's unlike anything I've, I've seen exactly before. Do you, are you, do you think this is like, all right, I've, I've got it now. This is, this is my style or do you want to move on to something else? Because like you say, it's got to change. Yeah, usually it's whatever I'm working on that dictates how, it's not that it even dictates it. It's like very gradually it's revealed to me how I'm going to approach it yeah. uh, in the process of reading about it and going someplace and thinking about it, watching films related, listening to music from that part of the world. And usually I just sort of, uh, you know, it's an infusion of 
material before I start sifting my way and sorting my way and picking my way through and then finding a form that will support what I think I have to say based on what I think I see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are, you, are you happy with the result, this latest book here? I was very frustrated working on it. I was so frustrated I thought it had stalled out on me. And, um, and then when I, actually when I got a copy of it and I read my footnotes, I thought, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but is that common? I mean, is, is it, is it, you, you mentioned this earlier, too, that it's a struggle. It's not, it's a struggle. It's, not, it's not easy, and that's the way it's supposed to be, right? If it's any good, you're going to have to, you're going to have to toil a little bit, right? Well, there's some, there's some projects that have come easier than this one did. There was one book called Deep Step Come Shining, which was my joy to write, and it had that feeling of writing itself. And it's a very strange book, too. What is it about? It's about, um, seeing. It's about vision and um, physical vision and spiritual vision and uh, artistic vision. And uh, it's a road book. I wrote it um, taking a, a trip, a road trip with my friend Deborah Lester, the photographer visiting outsider artist in North and South Carolina and Northern Georgia, ending up at Paradise Garden. Howard Finster's Paradise Gardens in uh, northern Georgia. Uh, it was just a f really fun book. It's my only joyous book, but um, because I have a critical yeah. intelligence more <laughs> than I do a celebratory one, so that was fun. But most of them are h much harder. <laughs> Understand. We, we always ask our guests if, if they'll submit to it to, to, to do a little reading for us, and I, I, guess, I guess you've sort of agreed to do that for us today. Sure. What are you going to read? I think I'll read um, something from um, Rising, Falling, Hovering. Which is the book before, before Which is the One with Others. Which is the book before others. One with Others. Okay. Um, this book was uh, about uh, domestic life, and uh, also a lot of it was about the Second Gulf War. Um, and about Mexico. And um, I'll read a, a poem called Like Hearing Your Name Called in a Language You Don't Understand. Since the day the bell was cast, I have sat in the bishop's carved chair and waited my turn with my feet crossed at the ankles and the leather of my huaraches cutting into the hide of my foot. From where I was sitting, I watched the light being drawn off the magnolias in the Plaza de Armas while the voices of the others quired in evening. I have risen to the lectern when the eyes of the host summoned. I faced the great open doors as the faces of strangers acknowledged their own losses. I saw the white trousers of the vendor flapping in the dust, his body engulfed in balloons, the children selling chiclets dispersed, the shoeshine boy putting away his brushes, the sum of his inheritance. I have read what was written there, said Gracias, and sat down again. I have climbed the pyramidal steps and felt winded and humbled. I have stood small in Baracha and been glad of not being thrown down the barranca alongside the pariah consul in the celebrated book. In every sense have I felt lonelier than a clod of clay, a whip, a bolsa, a skull of chocolate. I have been lured by my host's pellucid face and the blue salvia where the rooster is buried. Though I have worn the medal of the old town with forlorn pleasure, I say unto you, comrades, be not in mourning for your being. To express happiness and expel scorpions is the best job on earth. C.D. Wright reading for us there from uh, Rising, Falling, and Hovering, the book before, the most recent book, One with Others, and One with Others sounds and probably reads a little bit differently as the people who will okay. hear you read this tonight as we take what we'll find out. And it's changing. You say poetry has to change in order to, in order to survive. What are the changes that are coming up in your work and in, in poetry in general? What, what, where do you see it going? Well, it's always the next generation <laughs> that is uh, making, in, you know, ensuring that the torch is carried. And 
I see uh, film poems now. I see animated poems. Um, one of my poems was animated for public transit systems um, and um, the animation was done by students at an art program at, in Milwaukee. Uh, so I see a lot more collaborative work going on. Um, I see, formally I see poetry going in every conceivable direction so that it's really barely recognizable as poetry. It becomes kind of the default genre for uh, experimental works that no other genre will claim. Because is it good or is that, is that a good thing? It's, I think it's good, yeah. yeah. It's good. It means a big, it's a big uh, landscape, it's a big catch-all, but um, yeah, I think it's good. I mean, it's amazingly how healthy poetry is. C.D. Wright, uh, originally from Harrison, Arkansas, actually originally from Mountain Home, and, mm. and, and for all your acclaim and, and, and all your great work, thank you so much. And uh, thank you. we look forward to what's coming up next. And, and what is coming up next? Actually, I'm hoping to do a multimedia project on Vic Chestnut, who okay. was a recording artist sure. from Athens, Georgia. Okay. okay. To work with the musicians and painters. And so that, I don't know how long that will take or even if it will finally come to pass, but I. That's what I'd like to do. Keep our eye out for it. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. C.D. Wright on On the Same Page.